This episode of Techzilla is sponsored by Netflix, Domain.com, and the United States Air Force. Coming up on today's show, it's product day, the first phone with Google Android, and the new MacBook and MacBook Pro, and Dell Studio Hybrid, along with viewer questions on SDHC memory, bomb-proof MP3 players for work, and quite a bit more. So wash your hands and set the table. Techzilla starts now. Welcome to Techzilla, I'm Patrick Norton. I'm Veronica Belmont. Welcome back. I, I, Tokyo Game Show, you you look like you've eaten a lot of sushi. I do because that would be a lie because I don't eat sushi. Really? Yeah. You went to, so what did you eat So it's kind of weird that you think I look that way. I don't know what that means. Does it mean Healthy. That, do I look fat, fatter? Is that what you're Yes, because people gain so much weight. Veronica <laughs> Belmont left skinny, came back from Japan fat from sucking down Big Macs. No, but I did have, I did actually have sushi at the uh, the fish market. Really? In, in Tokyo. I got the, up at 4.30 in the morning. That fish market? Yes. Like Anthony Bourdain, it's like 10, it's like 40 Walmarts under a roof Correct. full of fish. It is absolutely enormous. And it was really cool. We almost got killed a few times by these like tractor things that they're driving around. The little tugs? Yeah, yeah. And it was just insane. It was really cool. Did you turn a corner and see something and think to yourself, people eat that? Several times, especially since I'm not a very adventurous eater and I'm also not a right. seafood eater. A few times I was like, ooh. So what you're saying is you had, like that. you had one of the pinnacles of culinary experience and it was completely wasted on you. No, I did go to one of the fresh sushi markets and I had some That's toro. Cool. So I, I did have some sushi. I had some toro sashimi. Very good. So it was good. And you say that well. Thank you. I, I've been practicing a little bit. And doing quite fine. So anything, <laughs> speaking of Japan, mm -hmm. along with the fish market, there was the Tokyo Game Show. There was, of course, the Tokyo Game Show, and that was the reason I was there shooting for CORE. And uh, we saw a lot of really cool stuff, great trailers for things coming up in the future. I mean, there wasn't anything too mind-blowing. Right. Uh, a lot of PSP games, you know, stuff coming up on the Xbox. But it was basically Nintendo's show for all intents and purposes. Is there anything you saw at the show that you were like, how can I get a copy of it? Well, I did play Loco Roco 2, which I'm very excited about because I love that game. You know, um, there's a <laughs> certain so cute. Ryan from in, formerly of Engadget who I can hear weeping softly no, in the background. No, he loves Loco Roco. Really? Even, yeah. I thought he had a Don't problem with Don't judge Loco Roco. It is not. Da, da, no, 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 no. Da, da, he introduced da, da, da. me to that game. Uh, Loco Roco is awesome, but at some point, if you're not playing it and you're trapped in a small space with a person that, that is, is like an apartment in San Francisco. That is true. Um, that, that it can be a little overwhelming, and but the, it's fun. The little oh no sound from the blobs. If you've never played Loco Roco, <laughs> play it. It's it's like Lemmings, only different. It's, right. It's evil. Kind of. Yeah. I'm very happy to be home, though. It's nice to actually be able to have conversations with people <laughs> and understand all the signage in my neighborhood. That's a plus. Have That's houses plus. that are numbered in order rather than in order of when they were Just built. When they feel like it. <laughs> it's the numbers little things. where they feel like it. But and anyway. of course the toilets. Oh, I like that. I like the toilets. I'm not even going there. Anyhow, I'm happy to see <laughs> Apple's new MacBook and MacBook Pro, so that was something nice to come home to. Uh, though the screens, they worry me a little bit. Just but a little bit. They're good for getting thumbprints. They're great for use as a mirror. And yes, if you want to, if you want to stamp your identity on your screen, that will definitely uh, work to your benefit. Uh, but we have more on that later, though. Yes. I'm going to be talking to uh, Engadget's Joshua Topolsky, and we'll have a hands-on review of the machines on this very show. You forgot, possibly because you wanted me to rant about it, uh, the complete and total lack of respect, much less support for <laughs> Blu-ray from our friends at Apple. I, I just, it's just basically like. Uh, it's not a lack of respect. I just, I don't know. I, I, they jobs. say it's just too much to deal with right now. You know, too much licensing to have to worry about. They just don't want to have to deal with it at this moment, apparently. It's very much like a relationship. I don't even want Too I, much pressure. You know what? I, I, can, I can deal with Steve being like, you know, Blu-ray is a bag of suck. We're not going to deal with it until the market's larger. Fine, but he did kind of say that. But one of the other but Apple people going, how you know, we have the best possible HD experience available on iTunes now. Obviously, means he's never actually watched it on a high-res HD TV. All right, all right, enough out of you. I think it's time we start actually helping some people on the show instead of just ranting about our own personal feelings on gonna this be stuff. Gonna be that way. Gonna be that I will way. Be that way. It. Okay. <laughs> 
Well, it seems that while I was away, you and Robert answered a question about TV calibration that got a few of you watching at home all hot and bothered, at least bothered enough to write in like Kevin, Richard, and Chris. Chris sums it up nicely. All Geek Squad home theater calibrations are ISF certified and have internal company training on how to calibrate TVs. The Geek Squad calibrators are the only ones allowed to calibrate a TV, and that is all they do to make sure they are the best at it. For installation service, they have other home theater employees that do that. Chris. Yeah, I think you guys uh, ruffled some feathers out there in Best Buy land. <laughs> I don't know if I... Robert, we had a viewer question asking if it was worth $300 to get your HDTV certified from mm -hmm. Best Buy. So, we do know that they have ISF certification. Mr. Heron's point was his concern was more that ISF training is not enough. Uh, calibrators need experience uh, to do the best job. And hey, dedicating staffers to do nothing but calibrate TVs, HDTVs, is a great way to get that experience, especially if their training's up to date and they have the latest calibration equipment. I think that's awesome to hear from. And I think it's awesome that we got a bunch of people from Best Buy watching. They actually Yay. have, uh, from what I have learned, a very extensive training program, especially around the holidays, to make sure that all their employees working in their respective locations know mm -hmm. exactly what they're talking about. So when someone sends you to the TV section, you're going to be talking to someone who knows a lot about TVs, but they also all have a very large general knowledge of all the different sections in the store. I think that's awesome, but I've also had experiences in big you box stores. You probably had personal not, experiences. Not, not specific with Best Buy, but I'm thinking of other big box stores where it was very obvious that were, they were being spiffed for pushing certain objects. S spiffed. Spiffed, like they got a bonus if they sold 25 really? of brand X television well, that week or something. Who are we to judge their business practices anyway? <laughs> Well, <laughs> that's internet what we do. video host. I guess that's kind of our job. And now a message from one of our sponsors, the United States Air Force. I'm Lieutenant Colonel John Wagner, uh, United States Air Force. I'm the, uh, the commander of the 45th Launch Support Squadron. You know, I've always wanted to be a uh, part of the space program, and uh, you know, the Air Force is an exciting place to, uh, to do just that. Most people don't realize the Air Force space program is equivalent to NASA in size and scope, and in most cases larger. You know, the shuttle launches about once a month, and I've got three launches here in the next uh, 30 days. So if you want to be in the space program, the Air Force is a great way to do it. Welcome to this week's freebie download pick, a free program that we find useful, fun, or incredibly interesting. This week's pick, Carbon Copy Cloner. It happens to the best of us. That hard drive that's shipped with your Mac will eventually get filled up, used up, or just passed up by better technology. But when it comes time to buy a new drive to replace the one you have, how do you move all that data from your old drive? drag and drop, reinstall OS X, use a migration tool, or maybe you should just sit back and let Carbon Copy Cloner do it for you. Carbon Copy Cloner is a simple OS X application that clones, synchronizes, and backs up your hard drive. With Carbon Copy Clone, you can create a complete bootable backup of your existing hard drive disk onto another drive, be it internal, external, or even on a network. The interface is pretty self-explanatory. On the left, you have your existing or source drive. On the right, you have your new or target drive. Just select the files or just a drive you wish to back up, clone, or sync. Then choose the cloning options you want and hit clone. Depending on the size of data you need to move, it can be a few minutes to a couple of hours for the operation to finish. You can schedule backup tasks on an hourly, daily, weekly, or monthly basis. You can even let Carbon Copy Cloner run a backup when another drive is attached, including iPods. You don't even have to log in for backups to start. So if you plan on adding storage to your OS X machine and want a simple way to back up, sync, or clone a drive, check out Carbon Copy Cloner. Up next, we've got several viewer inquiries about Dell Studio Hybrid PC. Andrew starts off with, is the Dell Studio Hybrid just as good as the Mac Mini? I love Apple computers, yet when I see this, I think it might be just that little bit better. Can you do a comparison? Okay, Andrew. Yes, and then Sam in Toronto follows up with, I heard a lot about the Asus E-Box, and I simply love the small form factor. I'm considering picking it up to replace my current home theater PC that is slowly dying. What thoughts do you have about it? Does it have the power behind it to stream videos, play movies, or even play some non-graphics intensive games on a TV? Or should I just suck it up and pick up an Apple TV or a Windows Media Extender? Sam. So let's start with uh, Andrew's question. Uh, he wants to know about the Dell Studio Hybrid versus the Mac Mini. All right, let me say this up front. I've been a big fan of the Mac Mini, except for the price. My wife and I use one for downloaded video and DVD playback on our home theater system pretty much for a year with no complaints. Front row works great for video, audio, DVD playback. I've spent a few weeks with the Studio Hybrid. Biggest difference between the Studio Hybrid and the Mac Mini is OS X. And you get more hardware for your cash from Dell than you do with Apple. With one major exception, um, there's actually uh, no wireless built-in wireless 
this is extra. Really? Because they're assuming, well, if you're using this as a home theater device, you're probably going to hardwire it because your performance is going to be a lot better. And a lot of people I know are hardwiring. No, that's not necessarily true, I, I think, with wireless devices. I mean, none of, of our computers in our house are, are tethered to the Ethernet. And how big is your house? It's, our apartment's fairly large. Fairly large. Yeah. Apartment. Yeah. Okay, everybody. I, they, okay. You're the, you're I'm just the, saying it's all on one crew, level, so that might make people, a difference. You're the first crew I've run into in a while that that hasn't hardwired their home theater PC. Okay. It's good to know. It's an excellent thought. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. A lot of people I know are going back okay, to hardwiring. Yeah, I mean, thing. that's fine. That's fine. But it's true. I understand. I just think it's kind of weird that that's not included. And that I completely agree with. It's a $70 VIG. You're going to charge 70 bucks to get 802.11n built into this, and they don't have a B or G option, which basically means go out and buy a cheap USB adapter. Both of them have analog audio, optical spit of out, which is great for home theater apps, Firewire, DVI, four USB ports, six on the hybrid, and the hybrid has HDMI output along with the DVI out for home theater PCs, which is pretty cool. Actually, you can see the HDMI output uh, right there, HDCP compatible, so you can do your Blu-ray or HD DVD playback. Good. Or I should say Blu-ray playback, because it's got an onboard Blu-ray option, HD. DVD is dead. It's dead. It's, it's the dead. dead. The graphics kind of <laughs> suck on but both But hey, it would be, why not? <laughs> Throw it I, in there. Who cause cares? Because I, I have Transformers <laughs> and the whole Earth series on HD DVD. The graphics suck, especially if you're into gaming. Integrated Intel on both. X3100 mm -hmm. for the hybrid, mm -hmm. 950 for the mini. The hybrid I'm holding has the optional Blu-ray drive, which adds a hefty $250 to the base price. And hello, it's got this beautiful skin. That's yeah. extra, though, right? Yeah. Well, it's really bizarre. For an extra hundred bucks, you can get bamboo or black or brown leather. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so if that's hot, well, actually, yeah, I'm kind of into that. It fits. Well, it's funny. I don't have the the stand attached to it. You can mount it horizontally or vertically. And compared to the big hulking behemoth of a home theater PC case I was running until a couple mm -hmm. weeks ago, it fits really well on a bookshelf. So, 10 100 gigabit Ethernet, which is nice. Um, in with I, everything. Yeah, I still can't. Believe there's no wireless option. It's a $70 option. Um, we're going to take the fabulous bamboo case off of here. Um, and they basically, this is what it looks like normally. They have six colors you can choose from. If you're into color coordinating. Wait, so six colors on the base model without having to pay extra, or exactly. six colors? Six for colors. The, basically, okay, they have so you like you know, anthracite, quartz, stone red, you know what I mean? All the appliance colors. There's six mm -hmm. basic colors on that. The best part about this, though, and I'm going to tease the engineers at Dell, is you see the little Dell lights here? There's yeah. one on each side. If it's vertical, both lights are on. If it's horizontal, just the top light is oh, on. Oh, it's gone. Isn't it's that bizarre? Gone. I can verify that information. I want to know I what the parts that. count was just to get it to do that. Um, the Studio Hybrid starts at 499 bucks <laughs> with an Intel Core Duo, uh, 1.86 uh, gigahertz, 2 gigabytes of RAM, 106 gigabyte hard drive, a CD-DVD burner, Vista Home Basic, and a built-in SDMMC card reader. You're going to want to add 30 bucks for home premium if you want to get the media center features in the OS. And you're also going to want to buy a remote control if you want to use it for a home theater PC. Um, can, I use, you use, can you use any kind of standard universal remote with it? Pretty much. It, actually, there's a, the Bluetooth option is available. Bluetooth is built into it. And um, you are going to need, I ended up using, unless there's some feature in it that I didn't find, I ended up using the fabulously ugly uh, external USB remote. Well, it's not that bad. I know, but it's like, it's one of those things where it'd be nice, you know, this right. would be it kind of takes away from the slim form factor when you've got another little hub. If I buy on one top. of these for my house, the first thing I'm doing is I'm hacking the IR receiver out of that and putting it in the and case And putting it in here. the case. Can um, you open the case pretty easily? <laughs> you can do anything if you're bored enough and have time. It's actually not too bad Touché. to open up the case. Um, basically, one Phillips screw starts the opening. Um, they got the touch controls on the front for the eject and the power. The Mini starts at $599, which is 100 more right. than the base hybrid. Yeah, but it gives you a uh, 1.83 Core 2 Duo, 1 gigabyte memory, 80 gigabyte hard drive, and it burns CDs and uh, not DVDs. Yeah. And uh, it's got no option for Blu-ray playback and no keyboard or mouse. But it does have OS X, yes. which is definitely a plus. Uh, front row, Apple remote, and wireless networking. Wireless. I, I yeah. I, standard. I find it fascinating that there's no wireless built into that one. Both of them are awesome low power units for a home theater, for your desktop, for your kitchen. The infamous kitchen PC. Yes. Um. <laughs> exactly. But what about um, Sam and his EPC? Okay. So, 
here's the thing about the E-Box as a home theater PC. Whether you're talking about the Mac Mini or the Dell Hybrid, they're essentially notebook parts without the expensive, they're like notebooks without the expensive parts. The monitor and the lithium ion battery, those are the expensive parts of a notebook. So it's notebook parts stuffed into a small case. The E-Box is an EPC notebook, which is a really low power notebook without the screen or battery, which means it's $299 with gigabit Ethernet, 80211 BG and N, an 80 gigabyte hard drive that's just as big as the uh, as the Mac Mini, by the way, and Windows XP. Small footprint, very low power consumption, not a lot of oomph. The, the 1.6 gigahertz Atom processor in it, uh, one gigabyte of RAM, also similar to the Mac Mini. Um, will play most basic videos, it'll play DVDs. Uh, it's gonna struggle with your larger, um, yeah, like sort of HD uh, MPEG-4 files, like big honking mm -hmm. 1080p uh, MPEG-4 files are going to be a little difficult for it. There's no DVD drive built in, so you're going to have to add an external DVD drive if you want to use it as a DVD player. Games, if they don't take much power, they'll run just fine. <laughs> <laughs> There's not very many games out there that don't take much power these yeah. days. Yeah, well, if you basically, if you want a big 3D shooter or a 3D heavy game, it's not going to run on the PC. Uh, what about Linux? Can you run Linux on it, on the eBox? You should be able to run Linux just fine. It's basically, it's a little tiny PC. It'll totally work for the Throne Theater PC if you don't want Blu-ray. It has potential as a car PC, a browsing computer, if you want something for the kids to do homework on. And if you like the flexibility of a full desktop operating system, um, you will have to track down some media center software, but it'll do fine. And in fact, you may like that because it'll give you more options than something like an Apple TV or a media center extender. If you just want to plug something in and forget about it and basically watch your media, Apple TV, Media Center Extender might suit you better. HP's Media Center Extender sells for like $250 now. The Apple TV starts at $229. Yeah, and if you're into that open source and Linux kind of lifestyle, uh, check out the Neuros OSD for $150 or so. Uh, not sure you need to suck it up at all, Sam. There are actually tons of good options out there for you. Yeah, the only downside of the Neuros OSD is there's no HD yet. They still haven't done an HD version. It's all standard def. But Come it's on, such dudes. a cool gadget. It's such a cool device. It's fun. It's to open play source. With. You guys should be working on this. And it's Collaborate, cheap. man. <laughs> and it's cheap. So it's good. Time for another email? Yes. All right, this week we've got Jason coming to us from Phoenix. Hey, Patrick and Veronica. Recently, my surround system died on me, and I was looking at getting a new one. Maybe a virtual system like the Sony HTCT100. I have a pretty small room, so I wanted to get you guys' thought on how good the virtual surround systems are, and if the Sony HTCT100 is good, or if there's anything better in the same price range. Thanks. Well, that's a good question, Jacob. We haven't really touched on virtual surround sound lately, anyhow, so here's a quick explanation for those of you who may be wondering what it is. Well, typically, to achieve surround sound, one would purchase a 5.1 or 7.1 system, which uses multiple speakers to kind of, you know, mimic the effect of sound happening all around you. However, if you're in a small space or just don't want wires or the hassle of positioning a bunch of speakers around the room, you might opt for a virtual surround sound system. Now, the virtual system usually has one strip speaker that you put, like, right. under your television and then a subwoofer. The single speaker works by affecting the sound waves in such a way that they seem to be coming from all sorts of different locations. It's psychoacoustics. It's psychoacoustics. <laughs> Science. Yeah, it's totally an illusion. This effect will definitely sound better than your TV standard speakers, but I'm worried that since you're coming off a true surround sound system, mm. that it might not be enough for your spoiled little ears. Um, unless it's a jank surround sound system. Unless it was pretty cruddy. <laughs> Who knows? You didn't say what kind you have, so we'll just assume that it was relatively good. I'll give you the benefit of the doubt. Um, I've never used the HTC T100, but it received a really good review on CNET. It's a good price for what it is, too, at $299 and under. Um, most wow. of these units actually go for between $699 and right. $1,000. I mean, they're not cheap devices. Um, similarly priced is the Philips HTS6500. But according to CNET, the sound quality wasn't quite up to snuff compared to the Sony model. Um, so if you're looking to shell out around $300, I might recommend another 5.1 system in that price range. Like we've got the Sony Bravia DAV HDX500 system, or alternately the Panasonic SCPT660. Um, both are really highly rated. They're around that price range. They won't break the wallet. Or hey, take your chances with the virtual system and let us know how it sounds. I'm kind of curious, yeah, <laughs> personally. No, and, and a lot of it, it's one of those things where some people love the way they sound, mm -hmm. some people don't, but if they're if they're done well, they sound they, they, it's freaky how well they work. Yeah? yeah. So you think they sound the pretty original, good then? The original Yamaha was really good. I mm -hmm. still I still prefer multiple speakers. I've also recently spent some time over at Dolby with System, learning sort of all the intricacies of surround sound setup. Right. And now I, I can basically hear just exactly how suck 
every uh, piece of surround <laughs> sound equipment in my home theater is. Oh, I'm sorry. It's, no, it's That good. must have been very hard for you. It was, no, it was, it was wonderful. I just want to go over and hang out there and watch movies mm -hmm. in those rooms. I have an Onkyo um, 7-1 system at home nice. that I really enjoy. It wasn't cheap though. I, that was like my big first, <laughs> like my big first home entertainment purchase. I'm like, all right, if I'm getting this TV thing. If we're doing this, I want a decent sound system. So I, I shopped for like weeks trying to pick out the right one. I, I like think it was thought. it was like 800 bucks. I think 800, 900 bucks. That was a lot of money. That is a lot of money. It's amazing, and but especially still it's if worth you get it. into speakers, you can start spending so much money so quickly. So quickly. Enjoy it. Now, if you want to get your 15 seconds of internet fame, send us a video. All you need to do is record. Record yourself in front of a video camera asking a question no longer than 15 seconds, preferably. Then upload them to YouTube and send us a link with video question in the subject line. No attachments. No me gusta. <laughs> Let's take a moment now to thank one of our sponsors. These are the people that help us bring the show to you every week. How about Domain.com? Techzilla fans, do us a favor. Use the coupon code TECH1 at Domain.com. You're going to save 25% off on domain registrations, domain transfers, and web hosting with our sponsor, Domain.com. And as an extra bonus, you make a purchase at Domain.com, you are automatically entered into the Domain.com giveaway, which wins you a chance to win a $500 Apple gift card. The rules? Well, you can find them at www.domain.com slash Techzilla. There is no limit to the number of entries, and domain names are under 7 bucks. so check out Domain.com for all your domain and web hosting needs. Time is running out, so hurry up and visit domain.com and enter to win. Don't forget, use the coupon code TECH1 for all your domain.com purchases. We're talking 25% off web hosting, domain registrations, domain transfers, and making all of your registrations private with domain.com's cheap who is privacy. Got a great idea? It all starts with a great domain, domain.com. Looks like it's time for another website we just can't get enough of, a website that we just can't stay away from because it's too useful, too funny, or just too darn irresistible. <gasps> this week's pick, Deletionpedia. Yes, Wikipedia is full of information, but there's plenty of material that gets taken down for not meeting Wikipedia's quote, rigorous, unquote, standards. While this policy is designed to help improve content quality and is generally beneficial, a page gets taken down once in a while for not being important or significant enough. Enter deletionpedia.com, your one-stop shop for anything and everything that no longer lives on Wikipedia. There are a few different ways to browse Deletionpedia to increase your chances of finding something worthwhile. You can sort by the length of time the article managed to stay on the Wikipedia, how often it was revised, or when it was deleted. You'll find such gems as types of facial hair, who knew there were so many, a list of Sonic the Hedgehog locations, and even a homepage on, quote, office romance, unquote. Each page lists the date and reason for deletion and links to the Wikipedia page where the deletion was debated. So the next time you're curious about what exactly didn't make the cut on Wikipedia, surf on over to deletionpedia.com. I understand our next patient has a, a, an issue, a difficulty with flash yes, memory. Yes, that is very perceptive of you, Mr. Norton. I read ahead. Using, oh, you, oh, you cheated. <laughs> okay. Alistair wrote in with this email. He says, nobody seems to have done a recent real-world speed comparison between the different brands of SDHC media. I've read that a 150-time SD can beat out a Class 6 SDHC on write performance, but my own 150-time generic card is substantially slower than some reported Class 4 cards real-world performance. The only thing that has become clear is that not all are created equal. Help! Oh boy. So, should we start with the whole like... So. So, so you, you go to buy some burnable CDs or DVDs and you think, Memorex, I like that brand. Or insert name of brand here. Or maybe it's the store brand where you're buying. Let's say it's the store brand. And you go, I like the store brand. I like the store. It's probably <laughs> a good brand. <laughs> and you buy it. And the reality is some guy in an office somewhere got the cheapest deal on discs he could get. And they wrap the store's label around those discs. And they show up in your favorite big box store. Now, you get things like Kodak or Rico archival grade discs. And they're generally you know, basically a higher standard. And they maybe are actually manufactured by the vendor. This is part of the night of, of, of flashcards, plus the simple fact that there are a lot of people who pirate or fake flashcards. You mentioned having a generic flashcard that generally means you're probably not going to get the super cool guy high performance. Now, 
Secure Digital, should we talk about that? Yes. Okay, Secure Digital is basically, it's a subset of the SD standard. It supports storage sizes greater than the two gigabyte limit of the original SD, and it's faster. And since the memory controller for SDHC is newer than the one for SD, you need an SDHC compliant device to make use of the card. Do not buy an SDHC card for your older SD only device. Right, speed is important for yeah. digital still cameras that switch to shoot in continuous mode. Uh, the camera can't write new data if in the previous data hasn't finished writing. And some new digital video cameras that use SDHC, speed is also an important factor with many requiring a specific level of speed. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's where the class rating comes in. <laughs> They're designed to guarantee a minimum write performance. This is one of those things. This He's so is, mad. This Look is, at no, him. I'm not mad. It's, it's like, like smashy. It, no, it's like it's like it's like HD. It's like they could have picked one great spec, but instead they have nah. like 17. Keeps things interesting, right? <laughs> <laughs> For us, anyway. Oh my goodness. Yeah. According to Wikipedia, um, specify the following minimum write speeds based on the best fragmented state where no memory unit is occupied. Oh, here we go. All right. Class two, two megabytes per second. Class 4, 4 megabytes per second. Class 6, 6 megabytes per second. So that kind of makes sense. You know, it's got the... 2, 4, 6. Yeah, there you go. Uh, that, what this means is that there's nothing preventing a Class 2 SDHC card from one vendor writing faster than a Class 4 card from another. The class rating only guarantees the minimum speed the card can be written to, not the fastest. Because, you know, when you're, it's 4 o'clock on a Sunday and you got to go to the kids' soccer game and you need an extra memory card, the best thing you want to do is be able to ask, do I need a 6X, a 4X, or a 2X right, memory card? Right, because that's really important to your daily life. Now, in terms of which vendors produce faster SDHC cards, well, you know what? There aren't a lot of flash memory roundups. We did find a pretty good SDHC roundup by Extreme Text Lloyd Case that came out with the SDHC cards first came out. Is there out. nothing the man can't do? I, if is there, there nothing he cannot do an excellent roundup on? It is. It blows my mind. I was going to say he He's cannot a leap a, a building with a single bound, but he could build something that would bound a device with a single leap. In there any case, Lloyd did a roundup of a few SDHC cards, and the results were kind of frustrating. They were interesting, to say the least. Uh, for example, a SanDisk SDHC Class 6 card was outperformed by an ATP Pro Max Class 6 card that cost considerably less than the SanDisk card. So... Um, That's interesting, especially because you would think, I mean, it's if, SanDisk. you would think if it's cheaper, it's got, a, it's got a certain name to it, you would expect it to perform in a certain way. You, you, you pay for the big brand name. Right. You want the big brand name performance to be better. Well, guess again. And a comprehensive SDHC card roundups are pretty much impossible to find. So unless you want to buy blind, your best bet is to check out the digital photography forums and shopping sites like Newegg or Amazon that post user reviews to see how mm -hmm. fast that SDHC card you're looking at might be. Those are really good. Basically, pissed off photographers post a lot of responses on Newegg talking about how bad a particular brand or a particular sampling of a particular brand because over time sometimes the performance changes. Absolutely oh and if goodness. any of you guys have ideas of where to find a breakdown of SDHC cards and reviews shoot us an email at techzilla at revision3.com. The web and our inbox here at Techzilla have been a buzz for quite some time about Google's Android mobile device platform, that's a big honking name, and the pre-sales on T-Mobile's G1, formerly the HTC Dream, which runs Android, are in the millions going through the roof. Now we have yet to receive a working model. Hey, it doesn't ship until October 22nd, but our inside connection scored us. Ryan Block, editor at large for Engadget and co-founder of GDGT. And rumor has it he's fallen in love or out of love. We're going to find out with the first Android phone. Operating system, hardware, both, are they separable, inseparable? So Android describes Google's mobile operating system mm -hmm. the same way that uh, iPhone has their kind of mobile OS X, sure. um, which, which actually runs not only on the iPhone, uh, but also on the iPod Touch. You know, Microsoft has Windows Mobile, uh, Nokia has Symbian. Um, so there are a number of mobile Symbian. operating systems. This is, this is the, the latest uh, smartphone OS to come out. <laughs> it all harkens back to breaching the greatness of Scion. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> Sorry. The, uh, I, what are the key features that, that make Android different from the other sort of smartphone, or I should say mobile device platforms? So the thing that people are most excited about is the fact that Google, Google basically completely open sourced the OS. Um, so when this device launches uh, on October 22nd, Google is uh, on that day or thereabouts going to basically release all the source code right. for the device um, or, or for the operating system running it. And uh, what that means is uh, you can hack this thing to pieces. I mean, you can get as deep and, and, and as dirty as you need to with uh, adding you know, your own apps, reskinning, uh, tethering it to your laptop, 
I, I'm just I'm just thinking of like, the, is is this an instant tech support nightmare for T-Mobile or I mean, because I, I just I think of I think of you know open source. I love it. I'm happy. It's cool. The idea that millions of developers or at least thousands of developers are going to leap on this to make it better. I think it's even more awesome. Um, I'm not going to be restricted to a stupid or am I? Are they, is there going to be sort of a single channel to get this stuff onto your phone or can I really throw any patch onto it I want? So it comes out of box with um, unauthorized apps right. disabled. And what that means is um, you, you're supposed to get the apps through the store, like a marketplace kind of similar to the app store on the iPhone. Um, you don't have to. You can, you can run apps that have not been quote unquote authorized. And, and all that means is that Google basically just checked on that developer to make sure that they are who they say they are. Right. right? It's not like Apple, where Apple looks at every single app that mm -hmm. comes through and says, yes, we want this, or no, we don't. They're not checking for quality or content or anything like that. They're just checking to make sure, are you who you say you are? In case if something goes horribly wrong, we want to be able to get in touch so with you. Bob in small third world country could be doing something nefarious with this application. It's up to, basically, unless you go to the special store, it's up to you to vet your content. More or less. Um, so when you get the device, if you want to go outside the store and install your own apps that are not you know, Google vetted, uh, developers first. You can do that. There's an option deep within the menus. If you're going to get that far and you're going to be hacking that thing, I mean, I doubt that's the kind of person who'd really be calling for tech support right. anyway. How is it as a phone, as a texting device? Is, is it, you know, because there's so many smartphones yeah. suck as phones. It's not bad. It's very raw right now. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know. Part of it is the Google aesthetic. I've never been a huge fan. Um, they've got great functionality right. and they do a lot of things right. But the UI is kind of an afterthought. It, it just feels very, very It's geeky. not even form follows function, it's just form follows. <laughs> it's, I don't know how many people are going to switch to this thing from the iPhone. Right. I mean, if you really like the iPhone experience, it's not really a substitute for that. It, it is in many ways the anti-iPhone mm -hmm. in that regard um, because of its rawness versus the iPhone's you know, uber finished, uber uber refined. Well, everything's like Google Maps is integrated it's so well. Yeah, with it's, it, it's done directory. so beautifully. This is well integrated and it's nice and it, and it, it feels like a 2008 device, but it still does feel raw. I'm, I'm really excited uh, for the potential it has as an open system right. and not so much what it has out of the box. Out of the box experience, not really that interesting. Uh, where we are in six months when it's been hacked to pieces right. and I can do anything I could ever possibly imagine with it because you can go as deep into the OS as you can possibly think of, that's new, that's unusual, that's, that's not what you have now. HTC's the the hardware maker on this. They make pretty good hardware. I've owned a couple of HTC phones. How about like the Google-based apps, Google Docs, Gmail? I mean, the, I was actually shocked at how fast mapping was was working on that. Yeah, I mean, all the Google apps work well as expected. Um, you've got out of box YouTube, Gmail, Maps, Calendar, Contacts. Not that anyone really uses Contacts. In fact, <laughs> the Contacts thing is is my biggest gripe. But maybe we can get to that later. Um, you've got a version of, of Chrome. It's not called Chrome. It's called Browser, right. uh, which is very generic. Um, <laughs> they they base it partly off the Chrome code base, and they'll probably brand it Chrome later. But right now, it's Browser. Um, so there's a lot of Google code that comes with it out of box. And then, of course, the marketplace and all that stuff. And it all works pretty well. If you're happy with your iPhone, if you're happy with your BlackBerry, if you're, if you're in love with Windows Mobile, you're probably not going to switch to this unless you're kind of getting your geek on. I don't know about that. I think that it could be an alternative to some casual BlackBerry users. It's mm -hmm. not a corporate device yet. There's right. no corporate you know, enterprise email support. Um, it's all very Google-oriented right now. So if you want to use Exchange, if you want to use BlackBerry Enterprise Server, um, you, you, you can't use this device yet. It's just not possible. I mean, it's really Gmail only. Right. Um, so for iPhone users, it might be a good alternative if you really want to geek out. For Windows Mobile users and, and Palm users, this is the device because Windows right. Mobile and Palm have been very, very stagnant over the last couple of years. <laughs> That's an understanding. As, as you know, as most people know. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to be nice here. You're, you're being very diplomatic. Yeah, I know, I, I, I am. Um, no, but I mean, these, these are mobile operating systems right. that uh, they, they haven't had a lot of forward motion. And uh, they've actually, I think that Microsoft really doubted that Google would be able to come to market with something like this. I mean, Steve Ballmer at one point said, you know, how many mobile Linux groups are, have there been out there, you know, and how many devices have they produced? Almost none. I mean, right. there are a lot. There's, you know, there's Lips and Limo, and there's all these mobile Linux groups, but they haven't gone anywhere. Open Handset Alliance, which Google pioneered with, with, uh, with the release of Android, Android itself, this device, this is the first actual time that we've had a, a good, working, right. open, mobile Linux uh, smartphone platform out there. So, there's no headphone jack, so wired headphones require HTC's proprietary dongle. Any other major complaints on the phone? Well, 
part of the user paradigm that they're going after here is that this software can run on any device. Right. I mean, touchscreen or no touchscreen, keyboard or no keyboard, you know, sometimes with a dial, you know, like right. a, a 12 key dialer, sometimes without. So there are some concessions that get made. For example, in the browser, there's no stop button because they don't assume that you have a touchscreen to just hit stop. So you have to hit the oh. menu button and then hit stop. So it's little things like right. that where they're not really considering well, what, what kind of enhancements can we make to the user experience, assuming that they have really good hardware. Uh, so it's not really entirely optimized for this. And, and on the other side, they expect you to use the keyboard constantly mm -hmm. instead of having anything on screen. Oh, interesting. Um, so yeah, I mean, if you're on a train and you need to one hand your phone, you're right, and, and do that, phone. you can't, right? At you have to do it sideways and then. Right. It's so it, it it doesn't have the same kind of you know one hand ability as but most wait, devices. But wait, someone could develop a patch for the operating system. So I mean, Android should have operation. that. That's the right. thing. Android, um, I, I, if I'm not mistaken, does have uh, a one handed touchscreen keyboard built right. in. I think that they disabled it uh, on this device to kind of push the fact that it has a keyboard and not be confusing. Right. Uh, because you give them too many keyboards, and it kind of gets messy. Um, <laughs> But yeah, I mean, there, there are a few things in here, and some of it might get fixed, some of it might get hacked around, some of it might just be that way forever. So are there any other Android devices coming in the near future? That yeah, there are a lot of companies who have joined the Open Handset Alliance, Motorola, Sprint, and their device is coming. I don't know when they're going to be here, probably next year. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it, it's, it's foolish to assume that there wouldn't be at least more than one device out on the market right. in 2009, um, but you know, the, the G2. <laughs> the T-Mobile G2, which I'm sure will be called, or, uh, or what have you, you know, the follow-on to this device, when Sprint's going to have theirs, nothing has been announced yet. Um, so, I mean, we're just going to have to wait and see. I don't think it'll be too long, but, you know, the interesting thing, and we didn't really talk too much about this, mm -hmm. is actually the possibilities of Android outside the smartphone market. Because it's an open, embedded operating system, this doesn't just have to live on your phone. You I mean, this can live in your DVR. Right. This can live in, you know, your car. It's time this to can crack live in your, a lot your of different places. Something other than, you know, Rockbox to run on your excuse me, your rock something other than Rockbox to run on your iPod, right. not your iPhone. No, um, I mean, yeah, this this is this is a system that has a lot of potential outside just the mobile handheld space. So, I mean, it's not unfair to, to assume that, you know, there, there might be an iPod Touch, right. uh, you know, kind of equivalent of this mobile operating system, or that it can start showing up in places you might not have ever expected. And car PC makers everywhere web softly. <laughs> <laughs> They've been waiting for something like this. Until now, it's all just been Windows CE, Windows Embedded. Don't forget Street Deck, which right. okay. sort of ships eventually. <laughs> Ryan, thank you so much Thanks, for coming man. in and bringing it in. Will you come back and tell us more about Gadget when it, or GDGT when it's ready? I will indeed. Yeah. Thanks so much, man. If you want to find out what's going on with Ryan, do yourself a favor. Keep an eye on Engadget because he's still writing for him. And of course, keep an eye on GDGT.com, which will be launching very soon. And there's stuff up there now. All right, time for our Netflix-sponsored movie of the week, Grindhouse Death Proof. Quentin Tarantino's latest contribution to the cinema stars the fabulous Kurt Russell as a psychopathic stuntman who messes with the wrong group of young women led by Rosario Dawson. Ridiculous stunts, exciting car chases, it's got a simple plot, a very simple plot, but the movie is a load of fun. And if you missed the theatrical release, you sure missed out, but now's your chance to catch the extended version. If you run it now, you'll get an extra 30 minutes of footage previously only seen in international versions. So add it to your Netflix queue now, and don't forget to check out the other 90,000 titles available at Netflix. Netflix, including a ton of Blu-ray titles with free shipping both ways to your home. And because they now have over 40 shipping centers, almost all deliveries happen in a single business day. Netflix has plans starting at $4.99, but because you're a TechZilla fan, we got a hookup for you, a free, no risk, two week free trial membership. Did we say free? You should check it out, www.netflix.com slash TechZilla. At the top of the show, we mentioned that Apple has released revamped versions of their popular MacBook and 15-inch MacBook Pro lines. Here to tell us what to expect from these shiny new machines is Joshua Topolsky, Editor-in-Chief for Engadget. Welcome to the show, Josh. Hey, thanks for having me. You had a fun time at the event this morning? Yes, a uh, shockingly fun time. It's uh, Tuesday today, but you'll be seeing the show on Saturday, so it's not really this morning. We're in the future. Yes, this is uh, <laughs> flying cars. So, what, <laughs> yeah. so what's going on with these new ones? Uh, well, so there's two new um, completely revamped uh, uh, MacBooks, uh, MacBook and MacBook Pro in the uh, laptop line for Apple. So there's a 15-inch MacBook Pro and a 12-inch MacBook. And they're totally redesigned, new manufacturing process, speed bumps, um, new uh, graphics chips. 
uh, and a bunch of new stuff, glossy screens, new trackpad design. So some big changes. They're very familiar in terms of design, but they're you know evolutionary, not revolutionary, but some some noticeable changes. So the processors got a bit of a speed bump, right? Yeah, they got a speed bump, and you can, for instance, you can kit out the the Pro up to 2.8 gigahertz. It's a Core 2 Duo, but you can get pretty fast on them. So yeah, they've both gotten small bumps. And so how much is it going to change now that they have the NVIDIA uh, cards in them? Well, they get uh, obviously a lot better graphics performance. As Steve was saying, five times what, what the current ones do. Um, but what's interesting is in the MacBook Pro, they have two chips. They've got this uh, GeForce 9400M, and then they have a 9600M GT, both NVIDIA chips. And you can actually switch between the two. So if you want to get better battery life, you can use the 9400. And if you want to go, if you're gaming or whatever, you're plugged in, you can switch the 9600. And um, there's actually kind of a, a rumor going around or speculation that when Snow Leopard, the next mm -hmm. uh, version of the OS, comes out, it's going to take advantage of that and take the load off of the CPU and put it onto one of the other chips. That's interesting. So what's the deal with Snow Leopard anyway? Is that like the stupidest name well, to go from Leopard to Snow Leopard? Well, it's like the Leopard opinion. is, you know, it wants to chill out a little bit or something. I don't know. All right. Please. I'll buy that. <laughs> no idea. But what do we have for hard drive space? I mean, I know I'm already running out of hard drive space on my MacBook Pro personally. But yeah, the is Mac going to give me more? I think the MacBook Pro starts at 250 and you Ooh. can get a 320 gig. And they also offer a 128 gig SSD, which will probably Probably cost six hundred thousand um, dollars. I'm not sure about the price on that, but yeah. The, so the drives are bigger, um, and RAM is about the same. It's DDR3 RAM, but you can get uh, I think up to four. I think it does up to four. Could do up to eight. Don't quote me on that. That might be a lie. That's your job. It's, I think it's up to four on the MacBook. It is. I think it's. A, it might be on both. Yeah. And what are we going to be paying for these? Because I know everyone was saying that they were looking for a big price drop or hoping for one at least. Do we get to see that in these models? Uh, not really. The the MacBook Pro started 19.99, and uh, then they have a 24.99 model and up depending on your configurations. And the MacBooks start at 12.99 uh, and up. They are keeping actually. What's interesting is they're keeping the white plastic MacBook around as their dirt cheap. Uh, so entry How level. How kind of them. Yeah, so the sort of their entry level <laughs> laptop. So that's going to be nine ninety nine, um, and I don't know. I don't know if that's getting any spec bumps. I think it's kind of staying the same. Now, why do you think they're not doing this with the seventeen inch MacBook Pro? Why is it just the fifteen? I don't know. The seventeen inch doesn't get the kind of love and attention. They have they have uh, bumped it up a little bit. There are a couple of things, but no new design, um, no new trackpad. So weird pad. to me. Well, I mean, I'm not sure the market for the 17 inch is that huge. I mean, how many people do you know who have the 17 inch? Like two. There you have it. Yeah. But maybe you only know two people. I so 100% of don't your have friends, many friends might have the 17 inch. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow, I don't think that's the case. Though. And what do you think of the uh, the glass and the screen? Well, if you don't mind, I'll just crack it open here. Um, I mean, you can see it's incredibly reflective. It's a mirror. It's really handsome looking, right? And this is what they say. They say the consum consumers love the glossy screen. The problem with the glossy screen is that every angle that you're at, it is, you know, I'm sure you can see, I'm sure everybody can see, it, it's just super <laughs> reflective and, and, and it's almost like a mirror when you're looking at it. It does look really beautiful. It's a very handsome display. They're not giving people a matte option, so you're just going to have to learn to live with it. Yeah, I saw a lot of people commenting on Twitter actually about how upset they were that they weren't offering yeah. matte screens anymore. Cause, I mean, if you're outside and using this or at a cafe, it's going to be almost unusable. Wow. Yeah. I think it'll be, uh, it's going to be a little difficult to use outdoors. And the trackpad is really cool, though. That's one part that I really enjoy about this. This model. is a new thing. This is a, they say it's a glass trackpad, although it feels a lot like the old trackpad. Um, it's just one big button. Uh, it's sort of like um, Rim is doing this on their new Storm touch touchscreen phone. It's a single button, and you use it just like a, it feels like a regular trackpad. Trackpad when you use it, I thought it would be very uncomfortable, but it's actually. About it's the not same. Bad. And yeah. this region is supposed to be like a right click. You kind can of area? you can turn this this the right corner into a right click, or you can right click by hitting both fingers the down finger, on it. Like the point. Okay. It's still though it's not as convenient as, as having a second button. To be honest, I I kind of wish that they had just added another button. I, I think this is the wrong direction. But what do I know? I'm not less buttons. I'm not, Steve, I'm not I'm not Johnny Ives. I'm not Steve Jobs. I'm just a just a man. One thing that kind of drives me nuts about my machine is that the battery life is gone in like an hour. I can barely even finish my coffee at a cafe before it's done. Yeah. Are we going to see some improvement here? Well, I mean, they say uh, that both of these get up to five hours battery life. So, I mean, Apple says a lot of stuff. I'm not sure in the real world that's going to apply, but, you know, I'm 
sure it's possible in some scenario. It's possible, depending on your <laughs> usage, maybe. I mean, if the screen is off and no you're just brightness. sort of guessing what's <laughs> happening on the, in, in, in there, then yeah, that's certainly possible. Well, thanks for coming in, Josh, so much. Thanks for showing us these computers. And uh, for all the latest gadget news, you can check out Engadget.com for more. And I think it's time we hit one more viewer question. How does that sound to you? He says, I have a question regarding MP3 players. I'm very active at work and want to listen to music. I was wondering if you could recommend a good MP3 player that would hold up to the wear and tear of running around and working in hot conditions. I thought of getting the new iPod Nano, but I don't want to spend $150 and then it not hold up. Thanks in advance, and I love the show. Well, I don't think you actually need to worry too much about the Nano not holding up. I mean, it's been a workout favorite for people for a long time, and I've never really heard of the Nano uh, breaking down due to heat or getting dropped and bumped around too much. I have heard a few things about scratches in previous versions. Right. Not too much in this newest model, though. They're, they, I mean, basically, flash-based MP3 players, doesn't really matter what the brand, right. are incredibly difficult to kill. That's the advantage yeah. of flash memory over there's a no, hard disk. There's no moving parts inside of it, so you can kind of shake it around yeah, and, and drop it and bump it. I just, still hate it when you do that though for some reason. But it's not gonna break. I know. But if $150 is more than you're willing to spend, there are definitely other options out there that are worth a look. Uh, the Samsung S3 Slim is $100 and under depending on where you're shopping. It's got good sound quality and the price is certainly right. iRiver and Creative are also solid brands that sell devices under $100, usually at 2 gigabytes and 4 gigabytes. Mm -hmm. um, since they're cheaper, you're also not gonna worry so much about <laughs> kinda messing them up a little bit when you're at the workplace. Yeah, and well, that's also one of the advantages of, because there's so many iPod devices sold out mm -hmm. there, there's also 42 million types of cases, whether they're rubber or, oh, yeah. or milled aluminum or some plastic thing that sits in between. So if you're really worried about killing it, um, wrap it, you know, put a case around it. Yeah, uh, but, that'll that'll be the, definitely be a line of defense against things that might chip or damage or dent your favorite MP3 player. But don't sweat killing it. They're really, you have to work at it to kill it or maybe like running into, you know, yeah, I don't even think heat would really be a problem. It would have to be extreme heat for it to have. It would have an to basically issue. melt it. Pretty much. That would be bad. Because you can leave it in a hot car for a long time, and I mean, I, I mean, I, I don't think I've heard of any of, a, of an iPod melting before. No. I mean, they've got aluminum cases Not on, without on the a nanos, fire. right? Are the nanos aluminum? I don't remember. Your most likely way to kill it is to, like, you know, run into a piece of metal machinery if you wear mm -hmm. it on your hip. I would not wear it on my hip. That's a great way to Or if you break smashed it and stepped on it and, like, ground your foot into the floor. That might have an effect. But it's more of an intentional thing. Where did this voice come from? I don't I, know. <laughs> for all of you watching, if you want to hear Veronica's happy voice yeah. more, Send us an email question. We live on your email questions. Email us, techzilla at revision3.com. Tech help, product reviews, how to's. You ask us, we'll do it, but we need those emails. So don't be shy. Did, did we mention? You can send them into techzilla at revision3.com. And even better, send us a video question. Think of all the fun you can have and the admiration of all your friends and family when they see your shiny, happy mug on our show. Just keep it to 15 seconds, like I said, upload it to YouTube, and send us a link in the email with video question in the subject line. And as always, you can visit our forums at revision3.com slash forum. You can find out more details on the site. Do yourself a favor, check out episode 30 of Pop Siren, where Mujan shows you how to throw the best presidential debate party ever and gives you the inside oh. scoop on the top places you should flee to if the economy gets any worse. <laughs> well, that's depressing. New episodes of Pop Siren debut, they release, they hit the street every Thursday, 3 p.m. Eastern, 12 noon Pacific. Check them out. That was fun. That was fun. I'm glad to be back. And we want to thank Ryan and Josh. Oh yes, toys. thanks to Ryan Block of GDGT and Josh Topolsky of Engadget for coming in and showing them, showing us their wonderful new gadgets. Yay, go check out their websites, Want. they have good stuff there. Want them. Speaking of which, thank you guys and gals so much for watching. I'm Patrick Norton. I'm Veronica Belmont. Until next time, you've been watching TechZilla.